Richard Herring, 58 St. Margaret's Road, Hamwell, London, W7. Uh, and I just only say you have a cough. Do you take your time uh, and don't get out of breath giving answers if you feel you need to pause. Uh, Thank you. In, in front of you, you should see uh, your submission. I have, yeah. Can you confirm it's true to the best of your knowledge and understanding and that you wish it to stand as your evidence to the Commission? I do. I did say that um, the experience with the ambulance today was in the middle of the night. Well, I've given you um, a copy of the complaint I sent to the ambulance people, which you haven't seen, and actually it was around about five to seven on a Friday evening. And, uh, so subject to that correction? Uh, yeah, and the other thing is I've been an impatient four times, and actually I have said in the last three years, one of them was actually in, 19, in 2007, but it's not ma really material, I don't think. Now, you've also just handed up another document, and again, that's but, being copied now. But, uh, all right, well, that's, that's the one. And yeah. you can confirm, can you, that you wish that also to stand as your evidence? Yes, please. Okay. Now, what I wanted, please, to ask you about, first of all, you say you've been a hospital patient, uh, and that, is that an inpatient and an outpatient? Both, yes. I now have eight ailments. I've collected two more. And I, as an outpatient, I've been seeing the consultant uh, once every six months for the various ailments, which I have. And the most serious one is I have liver sclerosis and... Um, that um, might have caused me to die uh, last March. Now, can I just ask you, was there a moment, you also, were you also, am I correct in thinking you've also had a number of admissions, uh, emergency admissions to A&E? Yes, um, I've had, well I took, in 2007 I took myself because it, um, we didn't have an urgent care centre. I had cellulitis and my head was swollen like a football, so all the consultants came to inspect it. Um, the remaining three were emergencies. I was um, virtually passing out at home in September 2012, um, and that was through loss of blood, and my haemoglobin count was very low indeed. Uh, and that's when they discovered that I had sclerosis of the liver, portal hypertension, bleeding uh, varices. And the second occasion was in October 2012 when I had a very severe infected um, gallbladder and that was when the ambulance took two and a quarter hours to get to me even though I could see the hospital from the bottom of my garden. And the third occasion was in March, April 2014. Um, again, I had lost a lot of blood, which I, I hadn't realized this. And uh, I was fainting, uh, nearly fainting. And um, so I rang up and got them to collect me. And they were treating me. And I was planning to go home and then in the hospital the big bleed happened and I lost two and a quarter litres of blood and um, they had to put some bands on my esophagus to stop all of that. Could, could I ask you just to confirm which A&E you were taken to? In all cases, Ealing. And can you help us with what you think would have happened if there hadn't been an A&E at Ealing? I think there's... I, I, from talking to the ambulance men on the ramp outside Ealing Hospital, I think there's a strong tendency for them to want to take you to Northwick. Northwick is, I think, six and a half miles um, using Google Maps, whereas um, Ealing Hospital is 15 minutes walk along the towpath. So what do you think would have happened to you if you'd had to go, say, to Northwick Park? <coughs> if you're not sure, say you're not sure. Well, I mean, obviously the whole press was, would have taken much longer. And with the event in October 2012, when I was screaming, and they took two and a quarter hours to get me to Ealing Hospital, 
God knows how long they would have taken to get me to Northwick. And in the end I became breathless and perhaps it would have got a lot worse. I, I don't know. Now if the accident of emergency of healing becomes an urgent care centre, are you clear about what it will and will not be able to do? Um, yes, I was reading it the other day. It's, um, you know, if you break your ankle or you drop a stone on your toe or you fall over, it, it, it's not a life-threatening situation as I understand it. And then it listed in the other section of this document I was reading the local GP, <coughs> um, life-threatening situations which um, you would need an A&E for and I definitely have a life-threatening thing that I have to live with for the rest of my life. So, bluntly, w would an urgent care centre be any use to you, do you think? Not so far as um, my problems have been concerned, not at all, no. Now, one of the other things you discuss in your <coughs> document is super hospitals, which is uh, what you've called them. Mm -hmm. um, what do you say are the problems with that model? Um, it's quite hard to answer that question because I'm not a medic I and I, I just read The Guardian and The Telegraph and the BBC website to get a lot of my information and talk through with friends. <coughs> Sorry. Um, well, I'm all in favour of super hospitals because we need medical science to advance but not at the expense of sacrificing the other hospitals, particularly if it means that they're going to close down. What I want to see is the spread of that wonderful knowledge that we have in this country um, being spread around our remaining hospitals. I don't believe in <coughs> specialisation that we seem to worship these days, unlike when I left school and uh, Mr. Mansfield left school um, when lawyers did a wider range of legal advice over a wider range of issues. They don't seem to do it, either the lawyers or the medics. And I don't agree with that. And if we could do it, uh, you know, then, okay, I, I understand why the law has moved in, and medical science is moving us in that direction. But you've got to draw a line somewhere. Otherwise, you are going to uh, have an awful lot of people in those pockets which are not served by those super hospitals because they're too difficult to get to. Um, they're going to suffer. And if it's going to happen, picking up on the Breen's point, um, that we're in a, we're dealing with hospitals in an area where you've got very high deprivation, we have some of the highest deprivation figures in the whole country. And I have worked with old people in deprived areas, both in Hackney and in Southall. Um, I think it's a disgraceful way to treat people. That, you know, you should spread the service more widely rather than just focus on one or two places with super hospitals. So where an earlier witness indicated that what was needed was not a world-class A&E in one place, but good, competent A&Es across the borough, is that a view you would subscribe to? Yes, very strongly. Now, and across the country. Now, in terms of the clinical commissioning groups, you make the comment in your submission that they have refused to engage with the public except what you describe as a barely minimal level. Now, given that the clinical commissioning groups <coughs> say they have consulted and engaged extensively. Can you help us with what you base your view on? I haven't had extensive con uh, co correspondence with the CCG. I've only written to them once or twice, but I have looked at some of their minutes, if you can find them on their website. Um, and they say that they have their meetings which are open to the public. I've never seen in the local Gazette an advertisement saying, we are having uh, our open monthly or whatever meeting on such and such a date. So who knows about it? And when you're dealing with areas such as Southall or such as Acton, they're not going to know anything about that, are they? 
Um, and I've, I've written to them and I said, I think you should um, write to all the, well, I don't know if it was a CCG I've written to, but I know I've written to McVitie and I've written also to the council saying that the residence associations should um, be notified of meetings. I think that um, the CCGs and the McVitie's of this world should hold more public meetings in here um, more frequently or if at all and um, get and tell the residents of Ealing what they're going to do to us what they're planning for us and to engage with us and to get feedback from us and I don't think they're working for the residents of Ealing or for West London as a whole I think they're working more for themselves and they're driven by politicians or the um, senior members of the civil service. I don't, I don't know. I, I wanted to ask you about a comment you'd made about, I think what we could describe as disaster scenarios. You, mm. you raise the, the question of what would happen in those scenarios. Can you expand a little bit on that? I've started some correspondence with Ealing Council over disaster planning if there's a flood in my area because we're in a flood area by the canal and um, I'm not at all impressed that they know what they're doing and um, they don't seem to have enough information. They, they had a disaster <coughs> exercise concerning a collapsed bridge in Southall in the last fortnight I believe. It hasn't had <coughs> except on one website. It hasn't had any reporting at all. So far as I can make out, there's no report of it in the Ealing Gazette. Um, and disaster planning. Well, um, they used to have them in the city when I worked in the city. And they'd have the bank station, which would be closed down because a bomb had gone off. And they used to engage a lot of people, as well as the services. and then. You know, people would learn what they have to do. Well, a collapse bridge in, in Southall, I wonder how many people learned anything about that. What do you say the impact of the reduction, if there is to be a reduction on A&E services, would have on disaster? Well, if there's a plague or something like that, some horrible thing happens, and we've got far fewer a and &E outlets, they won't be able to cope. Now, just moving on, finally, you make a suggestion that Ealing Hospital is being undermined by staff being moved from Northwick Park ahead of the closure. Can you help us with what you base that on and what you say is the effect? Well, it's very much opinion, but I, I, when I um, talk to the hospital staff, they tell me that people are, have been moved to Northwick Hospital. Um, so the pressure on the remaining staff at Ealing is increasing. And um, the reputation of Ealing Hospital, if you read local opinion, you talk to local people as I do, because I'm on a committee of a residence association, it's very variable. Unfortunately, I've had generally very good experiences at Ealing Hospital. Um, but if there's a drive to try and close down Ealing Hospital, and um, one of the councillors in the previous administration in the ward that I live in was convinced that Ealing will turn into a block of flats and won't have any hospital at all. Um, what's happening at say the senior management of the North West London Hospital Group is if they are taking out all the staff from Ealing Hospital people will end up by saying well it's the rump that we have at Ealing Hospital is not really serving us so yes go ahead and close it down. Thank you. I have no further questions but if you'd like to wait there there may be some from the commissioners. Yeah just one question given your contacts 
with your community? I mean, you've just been talking a bit about it, but um, if people are presented with uh, the, the, the proper options that are open, uh, rather than a fait accompli, it, how, how much support do you feel there is for the NHS as such? I don't know how to gauge the answer to that question. Um, I mean, are, are you saying how much does the population support having the NHS as opposed to a private system? Yes, I, I, I gathered from your last answer that the, the, the problem often facing you and other, take your residence association, is that mm -hmm. they, they, they feel, in other words, the decisions have been taken and you're having to face a different future. How much do you feel there is uh, a real resistance to some of these plans in order to place, let's take Ealing Hospital as an example, uh, as at the centre of the community. Well, on balance, I would say that there's a resistance to it. No. May I just talk about the West Middlesex Hospital? Very briefly. Yes. I'm quite familiar with the West Middlesex Hospital. That's where I would go if they close that hospital, uh, Ealing Hospital down. And there's no transport there, which as you know, that's going to be impossible. And the A and E, um, my mother died there in June um, 2011. Um, the A and E at the West Mid was chaos, and I understand that it's chaos now. Ealing Hospital, I've never encountered chaos on those four occasions and neither did I meet with chaos in A&E um, years ago when my children used to go to A&E on the rare occasions they got into trouble. So um, that's another reason why I want to see A&E Ealing to hang on in because I don't think we've got enough capacity and of course we all know that Northwick is not providing the capacity. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, that brings us to the end of today's hearing.